Good evening, everybody. It's time to begin our service this evening. Tonight, uh, I'll go ahead and announce it now. That way, everybody doesn't see this weird guy popping up. <laughs> uh, tonight is the preacher rotation. Um, so, Matt McBrayer, I said that right, correct, from Cerrito is here tonight. I have no idea where Chris is. Anybody have a clue where? South Point. So Chris is at, is at South Point, but Matt will be here this evening. Is that you with the Arkansas plate outside? Don't hold that against him. But I did see a Razorback on his front license plate when I walked in. Just got rid of some Arkansas people yesterday. <laughs> Our first song tonight is number 937. Uh, I stand in awe. If you would, let's stand for this song, please. 937. Our next song is number 71, Blessed Assurance, 71.
Our next song is on the overhead only. It's called A Shield About Me. I led this song a few weeks ago on Wednesday. I think it might have been the first time. Um, but I want to start singing it more. So it's a really easy song if you weren't here. Um, a Shield About Me. Now, Lord, I can feel about me your my glory, you're the lifter of my hand. Now Hunter Thompson will have our reading and prayer. Good evening, everyone. Scripture reading this evening comes from Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. The book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You are to meditate on it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it, for then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. If you'll bow your heads, pray with me. Dear God, I thank you for a beautiful Lord say that you've given us for the rain and the sunshine, the ability to come out to worship you and bring praise to your name. Father, I pray that you be with the ones who aren't here with us tonight, whether it be sickness or whatever's keeping them away. Be with them, put your hand over them, and shield them from whatever is afflicting them, Father. Be with us in our studies. Help us to grow close to you and be with us as we leave this place. Keep us safe. Help us always bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Our song of invitation this evening will be number 380, Just As I Am, 380. Now, if you would, let's stand, and we'll sing number 213, He Gave Me a Song. 213. He took my burdens away, up to a brighter day. He gave me a song, a wonderful song, a wonderful song. I now can sing in my joy of the spring. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song, he gave me a song. To sing a song, a wonderful song. have to admit I have a first for today and that is I was just introduced as some weird guy so well I was introduced to my wife that way as well this is a second time no I'm I'm just kidding I thought it was funny and uh, I am some weird guy to you I guess because I don't normally get in the pulpit here and uh, I know that uh, Chris uh, is uh, normally your guy, but I'm thankful to be able to be with you tonight and to talk to you about some things. I will say, I am driving my wife's car, and that's why there's an Arkansas plate on it, but I won't say who I root for, or you'll actually hate me, so um, I'm not worried about that, so we're not going to talk about that, Roll Tide. And then, um, yeah, see, they're like, now we're not going to listen to the sermon. You know, it's all over now, you know. Um, I, I know, I know, but, uh, you know, at one point in time, I used to not like Ohio State. So there you go. It's mutual, and we can feel the same way towards each other. But you know what? We're brethren, so uh, that makes things better, right? And that means that we can rib each other and get along and know that we're going to go to heaven one day with each other. And so, you know, it, it makes it all, all good. I... Uh, I appreciate, again, the opportunity to be able to come and preach. I know that uh, we do the rotation, and, and uh, I, I know that uh, I was actually, uh, I f- actually forgot about the rotation, and uh, Chris reminded me, so I'm thankful you had a preacher for tonight, and uh, I had to bring a Bible over here for Chris. Uh, Titus left it over at Cerrito last time that they were there, and um, I, uh, I am so scatterbrained about these preachers uh, swapping that uh, I, have, I told one of my elders today, I said, if it had not been for Chris, I would have missed this, I'm sure. 
And, uh, and I said, one of these days I'm going to miss one. I haven't yet, but one of these days I might just do that, and, and I, hope, uh, I hope that day never comes. Uh, I will tell you this as we get into this lesson. I am literally just preaching what I preached this morning. Uh, I know that this uh, subject tends to be uh, somewhat controversial, and so I, I would uh, tell you I'm sorry for that in the sense that, you know, if you were a part of the congregation where I preach, we would already have... Uh, some common rapport here, and uh, you would know exactly where I'm coming from on things. And so, uh, but uh, due to the nature that I studied this out really well beforehand, uh, I'm just going to preach it tonight, and uh, I hope you'll just listen to the scriptures here. In Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, uh, the scripture reading, you know, this is the book of law, uh, shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate thereon day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For that, then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Now, I start off with this. We are to obey the law of God. Now, sometimes people say, well, we're not under a law today, and that's actually quite false. We are under a law. We're under the law of Christ, Galatians 6 and verse 2. So we are under a law. We're, we're just under the law of Christ. Now, yeah, we're not under the old law. I get that. We're not under the old law. Uh, but there is a difference in the law. And actually, there's two sets of laws when you think about it. There is the law of God, and then there's a moral law that uh, just doesn't change. The law of God has changed over time. There have been, at least uh, when I look at the scriptures, three dispensations that we see. There's the patriarchal age, and then you see the Mosaic age, and now we're in the Christian dispensation. And during those times, if you look at Hebrews, uh, Hebrews tells us that uh, where there is a change in the law, there must also of necessity be a change of the priesthood. And so things change. I mean, we know that we don't offer sacrifices, so we, we get that. But what about moral law? Moral law doesn't change. What is the difference? Well, moral law is, you know, something that is a standard throughout time that God has already established. I'll give you an example. It has always been wrong to lie. It's always been wrong to steal. It's always been wrong to commit adultery. It's always been wrong to do all those things, right? But you know, there are certain things that fit in those categories. It's always wrong. Always. And that's because morally that's the case. There, there are no changes in moral law. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. And be not fashioned according to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So uh, our lives, our bodies are to be a living sacrifice. We are to, and I've, I've mentioned this even when talking to husbands and fathers and saying, look, you know, we need to uh, be breaking our backs to take care of our families both in the financial aspect, but more importantly, in the spiritual aspect. And uh, that's our job. We are to sacrifice our own selves. But that's really for all of us. We need to sacrifice our own selves, our lives, uh, for, for God. And that's pretty simple. Now, here, let's get to the point of the matter. And I tell you, this is something that I preach uh, just every year or right about this time. And, uh, and we're going to ask ourselves a question here, and we're going to ask it after we read this verse. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9, it says, In like manner that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly raiment. And so the question that I want to ask is this, has God defined what he means by modest apparel. What does that mean? I mean, here's the verse, and sometimes you'll hear lessons about this, and they'll say, oh yeah, we need to dress modestly. What does that mean? In this immediate context, the, the idea of, of um, not drawing attention to yourself is the main purpose of this particular passage, but there's an undertone here asking about what modest apparel is. Well, the, the verse says that 
a, uh, in this I want to back up just for a second. The things that we're going to be teaching tonight are not just for women, but they're for men and women. Uh, both of these uh, are, all these things that we're going to mention are mentioned for both men and women. It doesn't change because of, of uh, a gender. This is all the same uh, according to God. But we see that the word here, adorn, uh, means to arrange. And then modest, the word modest means observing the proprieties of sex, chaste or decent. Now, if you would and you want to open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3, we'll start right there and we'll move along through this. But in Genesis chapter 3, uh, this is in your Bibles, you may have something that will say something like, the fall of man, or Adam and Eve sin, and we know what happened. Adam and Eve are in the garden. Everything is perfect. Eve is tempted by the serpent. She goes and she takes to that fruit because you know he has tempted her in all ways of of sin here, and you know she sees that it looks good, that it's good to eat. So she she partakes of this fruit of the tree, which she's not supposed to partake of, right? And then once she does that, what does she do? Well, she tells Adam that he also should partake, and so he partakes as well. And uh, then they realize something. It says that as, they're, uh, as they've done this, they, that they realize something. They realize that they are naked. And so then they go, and the scripture says that they make for themselves uh, aprons, which you know, this, this, I've, I've looked at different things as to what this possibly could have been. And um, uh, I've seen anything from a loincloth or something that would have been akin to a modern bathing suit, covering very little, leaving little for the imagination. But they're trying to cover themselves, and so they sew together these leaves in order to do this. Well, God then comes to them, and they hide. And they, even though they've already made for themselves some type of clothing, do you remember what their response is? God asked why they're hiding, and they said, well, we hid because we were naked. Now, wait a minute, they already have clothes, but they have determined in and of themselves that their clothes yet are not sufficient. It is not right yet. And God even furthers that by, as we look in verse 21, he makes for them coats of skin. And the idea here, and maybe some of your uh, versions, uh, I think the King James says this. I'm not sure. I believe the New King James may say this. And that is that they says that God made them tunics of skin. And a tunic literally is a long shirt-like garment, generally with sleeves. And this would have covered Adam and Eve from their shoulders to their knees. Now, modesty or nakedness is a part of God's moral standard and does not change. And we know that because we have ideas from the Old Testament also going into the New that describe these things. But I want to point a few verses out. And if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to look along with me because I don't want you to think that I'm up here just making stuff up. And uh, I have a PowerPoint that'd go along with this, make it easier for you. But look at Exodus chapter 28 with me. Open up your Bibles. Uh, if you got a cell phone app, go ahead, do that, pull up what you can. Exodus 28 and verse 42. It says, And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover the flesh of their nakedness. From the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach. Now, Easton's Bible Dictionary describes this. Uh, the linen breeches is an article of clothing that covered from the waist to a little above the knee. Now, I think there's some importance here because if you look just a few chapters over in Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 26, it says, Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy naked nakedness be not uncovered thereon. And so this would give us an understanding that, um, you know, we've got steps walking up here, you know, um, yeah, I, I've, I've not worn a dress, so I don't really know this as well as you women do. But I know that uh, if you're wearing a dress and you start walking up steps, what's going to happen is that thing's going to flip up a little bit, right? And you're going to expose a little bit more of your leg uh, when you do that. Well, that was the idea given to the priests. They were not allowed 
uh, to have steps going up to the altar, but they built a ramp. And the reason for that is so that when they walked up the ramp, that same thing does not occur on the ramp so much as it is a gradual incline. And, uh, and so uh, that would not reveal their nakedness whenever they were walking up. As you, as you saw, that linen breeches, they, it doesn't go all the way down to the knee. It comes almost to the knee. And the thigh is described as nakedness according to uh, Isaiah 47, 2 and 3. And so the, uh, the thigh being nakedness, um, we know that, uh, that that wouldn't have to be covered up in order to uh, agree with God's, God's requirements. In Isaiah 47, 2 and 3, in verse 2, it talks about them uh, uncovering the thigh. And it says in verse 3, thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance and I will spare no man. And so the idea uh, is here that just simply in these few verses that we looked at, that the thigh is nakedness. And there is, you know what, sometimes you'll hear someone say this. I've, I've, I know that growing up we said this all the time. We say, well, that person is half naked. You know, someone's not dressed properly, they're half naked. Actually, not so when concerning the things of God. They're not half naked. They're either naked or they're not. Now, that doesn't mean that they're completely nude, but it does mean that according to God's standard, that they are not uh, living by that standard. Now, going back to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 9, it says, uh, Remember, in like manner that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly raiment. Now, the word apparel is from a Greek word that means to send down. And uh, the idea of this is that, of course, if you had a garment uh, that's a shirt-like garment, how do you put that on? You put that on over your head, and then you send it down your body. And that was a thought, part of the thought process. Uh, we'll mention later on something that Thayer said uh, in another comment. But um, some of the Greek women wore the robes open on each side, and this would be something like a slit. You know, sometimes uh, you know, people wear slits and dresses, and they would come up. But um, it says that they wore these on each side from the bottom up above the knee so as to discover a part of the thigh. And these were termed discoverers of the thigh. But it was, in general, only the young girls or immodest women who wore them thus. This is, you know, um, out of commentaries that uh, uh, I believe that was Adam Clark who said that. In John chapter 21, though, this is something that we need to understand as far as men are concerned. John 21 and verse 7, it says, That disciple, therefore, whom Jesus loved, saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his coat about him, for he was naked, and cast himself into the sea. Now, I have talked about this with people. Basically, what's going on here is uh, you have Peter and he's not wearing a shirt, and he's with guys. Now, I, I have heard some people talk about this, and they'll say, well, you know, it says that he was naked, and they don't understand the context of that, and they're acting like uh, Peter is completely naked in the boat. And I've got to tell you, I've gone fishing with a bunch of guys. If I had a fishing buddy like that, we would not be fishing. That is just not something you'd want to do. You don't want a guy that's completely naked with you on the boat. That's just not what's going on here. What's going on is he is still wearing an undergarment. It's just that he is wearing something like uh, some long boxers, and then he doesn't have a shirt on. He sees Jesus. They're coming closer to land. He puts his coat back on. He puts his clothes back on. And uh, so that gives us an understanding. There's two things here, and that is that when uh, uh, nakedness is talked about, it's talked about a revealing of the upper torso as well as anything above the thigh. Now, all this being considered, going back to that word for tunic, it's, some, it's a garment that was being covered from the neck to the knees. And so it's, it's important for us to realize what is being said here. Now, uh, I want to ask this question. Can apparel identify a person's heart? And I know sometimes we think, well, you know, no, not really, right? Well, actually, the Bible says contrary. Matter of fact, in Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 10, it says, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire 
of a harlot. Have you ever heard of anybody describe somebody like that? You know, they say, oh, you know, she's, she's dressed like, I know that like we would say things uh, about, uh, uh, I know that going to high school, I had a, a bunch of friends that weren't uh, Christians, and, uh, and I had a, a friend that, uh, I'll tell you what, pretty worldly at the time, and even being worldly, uh, I looked over at my friend and I thought, I'm embarrassed to go out in public with you. This looks really bad. And I even said something, and I said, go put some clothes on. You look like a hooker. Let's not do this. But we know what that would look like. We know that there are things that a person could wear, and it would tell you what kind of person they might be, right? Um, so, you know, this, this does describe uh, a person, uh, a, what a person wears can describe uh, their heart. It can identify who they are. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28, it says, Ye have heard that it was said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that everyone that looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now, we know this. This is something that has been said multiple times. I know that it's not the first time it's been said here. And that is that we should not, and particularly this is talking to men, this doesn't exclude women, but it's talking to men. And I think the evidence is, is pretty, pretty easy to understand that, that men tend to be more physically involved and they see things and, and, uh, and they can be tempted by that sight, uh, whereas women tend to not be that way. Uh, but that doesn't omit women here. It's just saying this is a temptation mainly for men. Men should not be looking at a woman to lust after her, of course, saving for his own wife. Now, why do we mention this in this regard? Now, uh, I have heard the argument being said, well, I can wear whatever I want, and if somebody looks, it's their problem. Um, well, to a degree, yes. To a degree, it is their problem, but... Uh, that's not the entirety of it. In Luke 17 and verse 1, it says, And he said unto his disciples, It is impossible that occasions of stumbling should come, but woe unto him through whom they come. So here's the point. If you are dressed immodestly and you cause someone to stumble, you have a responsibility in the matter. If you are dressed immodestly, you could cause someone to stumble, and that shows that really, and this is, this, I hate to say this, but it shows a lack of concern for someone who is either lost or, you know, a brother even in Christ. And that, that's a sad thing. We don't need to be selfish and uh, we need to be thinking about other people and whether or not uh, what we are doing and what we are wearing promotes godliness or not. Now, uh, I, I've even thought about this because in um, Acts chapter 19 and uh, verse 19, uh, it talks about something very, uh, very specific, something that, that, only, uh, that I know of that only happened once in the scripture, and that is that there were some people that they had uh, these magical books. They had magical books here, and uh, they, they practiced this magical arts. Verse 19, it says, they brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. And so uh, I looked at this. This is pretty interesting. I wanted to make mention of this for a couple of reasons here. Uh, but this was an expensive endeavor. You know, they, they could have you know, taken those magical books and they could have sold them, you know. They could have made some money off of it. Uh, but what would have happened if they did that, they would have sold it to someone to do wrong, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, they're going to go and practice magic. That was wrong. They shouldn't do it. So what did they do? They got together and they burned it. Now, um, 50,000 pieces of silver. Um, I went and I looked this up because I, while I was reading through and looking at this, I thought, how much is 50,000 pieces of silver. And I, I had several different um, thoughts that came up. I did some math and tried to figure out. I found out some, you know, uh, some super conservative numbers here. 
Uh, I'm going to give you what I think is a realistic number. I saw upwards to $5 million worth of books. Uh, I believe it probably was upwards to a million, though. Uh, that would be in our current currency. So 500,000 pieces of silver, uh, and uh, man, that's a lot of money. And they went and they burned those books in front of everybody. They're saying, we're going to follow God, and we're going to get rid of these things. Something similar happened in my life. I, I, uh, I'll have to admit that um, while uh, I would like to say that my life has been lived in all good conscience, just like Paul, uh, I know that there was a time before I became a Christian that uh, I was involved in things that I shouldn't have been involved in. Matter of fact, some of those things still lingered on when I became a Christian. And one of the things that I had to come to uh, some realization on was the things that I was, you know, putting in my mind, uh, namely the movies that I watched. And, I, you know, before I became a Christian, I didn't have uh, much of an idea of, of what I could or could not watch. I just watched the things that I thought were interesting. It didn't matter what was in it. When I became a Christian, I decided, you know what, uh, I need to make sure that uh, whatever I watch, maybe it just doesn't have nudity in it. And I just kind of drew the line there. Uh, as I grew as a Christian, I knew that I needed to kind of pull that back, way back, and understand that I needed to, to change the way that I, I viewed these things and, and what I watched. And, uh, and so I had this DVD collection. I don't know. I think conservatively I probably had about 300 DVDs or something like that. And uh, I determined, you know what, I just need to get rid of these things. So I just went and I tossed them. I just tossed them. Everything that just wasn't, uh, wasn't clean, I got rid of them. Um, later on, I found that I could have kept most of those and watched them on like Clear Play or something like that later on. But uh, nonetheless, I got rid of them. That's what I thought I should do at the time. Um, the same thing should happen if we have things that we cannot, as far as modest apparel is concerned, if we, don't, if we cannot alter that to where it is in sight with what God wants, then we just need to get rid of it. Um, as, uh, as I was looking through these things, uh, my father-in-law, he's also a preacher, and I had, I had talked to him about some of these things, and, and, uh, and I asked the question, why do you think that these things are going on? Why is it that this is not taught very much, and, and uh, why is it that uh, we're uh, having such an issue with this in the church and, uh, and, and my father-in-law said this. He said, the only reason that I can think of that a man would allow his family to dress modestly and to visit these sinful environments are he enjoys the atmosphere himself and will sacrifice his wife and children to feed his lust, or he is not man enough to stand up to his wife and family and insist they dress godly. Neither makes sense for a normal, thinking, spiritual man. You know, in time past... Uh, it is uh, uh, impressive, you know, how things change. But in time past, uh, we know that people had problems with uh, things like the showing of calves and the showing of ankles. I know that that's one of those things whenever I've preached on subjects like this. Sometimes people say, well, maybe that's what you just want us to get back to. That's not true. I'm not against, uh, uh, you know, wearing shorts that are uh, modest. I'm not uh, concerned about that, you know, uh, I think that even some of these things, like going to the beach, you can go to the beach. I know um, uh, I've done that on several occasions, but I tend to take, you know, my friends or family, whoever it is, we're going to dress properly, and we're going to go away from where everybody else is and find some privacy because, you know what, we don't want to be a part of that environment. I'm not saying any of these things are in and of themselves wrong. And I believe that you uh, ought to be able to understand that. But um, sometimes people want to say, hey, you know what? There was a time when people thought that you had to hide your ankles and your calves because you'd cause someone to lust. Well, the idea here is not really that this is, none, none, none of this is about lust in particular, but according to God's standard. Now, um, I want to make some mention of some things here. Now, I, I was able to go... Uh, uh, several years back, uh, while I was a part of the Memphis School of Preaching, uh, we have a restoration trip, and uh, we went up to Willing, uh, West Virginia, 
And if you've ever been up there, that's where uh, Alexander Campbell uh, lived, taught in the college over there. And across the street, practically from the college, is an old church building, and that's where they met. They also had different interests for men and women, you know, so as not to uh, uh, see a, a woman's ankles. Or, and, um, and, of course, when you get in, even uh, the pews are split down the middle. There's a divide in the middle of these pews. Uh, the men would sit on one side and the women would sit on the other. Um, I'm not, you know, encouraging that um, because, see, here's, here's the point. See, back in that time, culture was dictating that they were to cover more than what God required. Now, what would be our response to that? If, if we are going to be like Paul and become all things to all men that we might save some, then what should we do in that regard? Well, then we're going to have to wear those garments that don't show the ankles and stuff. Of course, I think we're all glad we're not there, right? Um, but at the same time, if society says a person is modest by wearing less than God commands, we need to obey God rather than man. You know, someone might say, well, you know what, this doesn't affect me. And they'll go back to this idea of lust. You know what? I don't. I'm not. I'm not uh, lusting after these people. Of course, I've mentioned that's not even the concern. It's just following the standard. Uh, but I will say this though: that um, I've had a lot of men get upset and come and talk to me about this. And and in First Timothy four and verse two, uh, it says this: through the hypocrisy of men that speak lies, branded in their own conscience as with a hot iron. It is possible for us to have our conscience seared as with a hot iron and that we don't feel as much of a problem as we used to. That's called getting used to sin. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen this. This is not something that I, I know that we evidently are football fans around here. Um, and I know uh, a few years back it was really popular to brand your shoulders. Do you remember that? Do you remember you'd have these big old brands sometimes? Uh, pro There's probably a couple of Ohio State, you know, brands on there. I know there is. But there was, a, I remember in Texas, they'd have that Longhorn stamp on them. And, and it, it, man, I tell you what, that looked painful. What it is is they'll literally take a brand and then they'll stick it on a person's skin. And that what happens is, is it just completely damages the skin. And it will puff out just like on a cow, literally. And um, it'll puff out. And they'll have this giant protruding scar off of uh, their arm because they've been branded. And I have heard that uh, you, could, you could go and you could poke at that thing. You go to a cow that has a brand on it. And you take a pin and you could poke that thing. And the cow's not going to feel anything because it has been seared and it can't feel it. Now, that can happen to our consciences. You know, we can get so used to seeing something that we forget that it was ever wrong to begin with. And I believe that that's probably what has happened to many people in today's society. In Jeremiah 6 and verse 15, it says, where, uh, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall at the time that I visit them. They shall be cast down, saith Jehovah. So we need to remember that just because something doesn't bother us doesn't mean that it is okay with God. We need to remember that we're all judged by that same standard, the word of God. John 12, verse 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. In 1 Corinthians 5, talking about withdrawal of fellowship, in verse 10, it, it speaks of this idea of not being able to take yourself out of the world. And uh, the idea is we have to deal with things in the church, but we can't convince the world to do the same thing. And if we're going to withdraw ourselves from the world, we're not going to be able to you know, live in this world. Uh, sometimes people will say, well, according to what you're teaching, Matt, you can't go to Walmart. Um, well, see, the thing is, is that I'm trying to talk to Christians 
I'm not in charge of talking to everybody about this subject. I'll try to bring everybody in. We're going to evangelize. But um, I cannot expect the world to live to God's standards. I just can't. And so what am I going to see? I don't like being around people that curse. Um, when I go to the store, sometimes that's what I'm around. You know, so many people have very little common decency anymore that that's pretty much all that many people do. You know, you've heard it. You know. But um, we can't take ourselves out of the world, but neither do we put ourselves into it. We don't look for these kind of environments. In Job 31 and verse 1, Job says, I have made a covenant with mine eyes. How then should I look upon a virgin? You know, sometimes people will say, well, you know what, my sport necessitates that I wear this certain thing. And, uh, of course, in the Olympics uh, news for the last several years, this has been a hot topic. And uh, the reason is, is that and I don't even watch this stuff. I'm not really concerned with the Olympics, and maybe, maybe you aren't either. But if you aren't uh, aware, uh, evidently, the, um, especially for the women, uh, the outfits that they require the women to wear uh, leave uh, less to the imagination. You know, they're, they, they are, um, you know, basically exposed quite a bit. And uh, there's a lot of talk about the sexualization of these Olympic athletes. And some of these, you know, are not just women, uh, but these are young girls being sexualized, you know, or, and this is a, just a sad, sad thing. Uh, but here's the point. If any activity calls for a person to violate God's commands, then a Christian should not participate in it. All right, so I want to make mention of this as, as we uh, close out our thoughts here. And uh, I want to make mention of what some other gospel preachers have said because I know that maybe, I know this is not a really popular topic, and I know that maybe it is that this might even be the first time you've heard it taught like this. Um, and so I, I don't want you to think, well, Matt's just making stuff up and just, just uh, teaching what he wants to teach. Uh, what is it that other people are teaching? Well, I, I want to talk about some uh, gospel preachers and what they have said. Now, my father-in-law had uh, written this article on the subject, and, and, um, and he had uh, written some gospel preachers asking them uh, basically this question. Uh, he explained what he was teaching, which is pretty much the same thing you've heard tonight. You know, and um, he, he asked uh, these preachers the question whether or not he was teaching the right thing. And then also uh, he applied it to specific situations like going to the beach and, and mixed swimming and things like that. And, and so he asked these preachers this question and said, hey, uh, what, what do you think? Should we be teaching this the way that I'm teaching it? Should we be giving this uh, specific, uh, these specific examples? Because some preachers were actually saying, you shouldn't be giving these examples. You shouldn't be giving people these examples of, of what to wear or what not to wear, and then versus this idea of, of where they can go and do these things. So um, just, just so uh, you know, I'm going to read off uh, a few of these. Um, Garland Elkins. Now, you may remember Garland Elkins. I believe uh, you may have known his brother uh, even better in this area. Uh, he preached over at Flatwoods for several years. And I know that Garland Elkins held meetings over there. Garland Elkins from the Memphis School of Preaching wrote, You are on solid and safe scriptural ground when you oppose immodesty. The Bible certainly teaches that immodesty is sinful. There are many defenders of immodesty, but there is no defense. Of course, the activity of swimming is not wrong, but the scant bathing suits and near nudity are indeed wrong. It is wrong to expose one's nakedness, whether in bathing suit, shorts, or a dress, etc. It is proper to give examples of immodesty. E. Claude Gardner, President Emeritus of Freed Hardeman University, wrote, Some may believe that they can participate in mixed swimming without consequences, but their participation may become a stumbling block to others. Buster Dobbs, you may remember that name, Buster Dobbs, editor of the Firm Foundation, wrote, Shamefacedness helps define the word modest. It means, among other things, bashful. A person who is timid, shy, and easily embarrassed will not expose as much flesh as the average bathing suit bears. 
Someone asked the question, if today's swimming uh, attire is modest, how much more would a person have to, to take off to be immodest? Your position is the que- is on this question is doubtless correct. Uh, Leroy Brownlow, you probably know that name. Uh, Leroy Brownlow had uh, written a, a, a book, and several books actually. Uh, one was Why I'm a Member of the Church of Christ, has been uh, a book that has been passed out several times uh, uh, throughout, uh, throughout the years. Leroy Brownlow, minister, writer, and publisher, wrote, We know that we are considering a command, 1 Timothy 2.9, And we know that the purpose of a command is to apply it and control the conduct of an individual. Why have a command if you don't apply it? Yet there are those who don't object to preaching 1 Timothy 2.9 if you don't apply it. But if a preacher does not help the people to apply a command, what is his job? I don't know if y'all know this uh, preacher as much. And, of course, in Tennessee, uh, this is a a bigger name. Uh, He is... uh, Uh, still with us, but it's really up in years. Robert Taylor Jr., minister and writer, wrote, You are right in what you preached, and they should hold high your hands. You were right to name mixed swimming as a specific example of immodest dress. The families there who participate in such should give it up promptly. Such is not becoming a Christian. Uh, Johnny Ramsey, uh, hopefully you know that name. Johnny Ramsey, minister and teacher for the Brown Trail School of Preaching, wrote, I agree with you 100%. What you said and the applications made are needed everywhere. We must apply what we preach on any subject and certainly on modesty in these wicked and worldly days. Hardeman Nichols, minister, wrote, Thus, with the two terms modest and shamefacedness, this scripture commands modest apparel from a modest heart which is rooted in a character that considers the effect of a Christian's dress upon others and would always restrain a good person from an unworthy act or appearance. In the light of the language, I believe a mature heart must reach the conclusion that the type of dress and the close proximity of both sexes in the general setting of mixed swimming is forbidden by Christians. I would not be surprised if some good people do not know how to apply the principles of the Bible to many specific cases of immodesty. Since we live in an immodest age, it would be easy for one's sensibilities to be dull. Does the scanty attire associated with swimming where both sexes are present war against my soul or the souls of others? I think the answer is obvious. Then God begs us to abstain from that attire. That, God, uh, that goes for both male and female alike. David Farr. And you know David Farr. David Farr has a, a book, and um, we pass it out a lot over at uh, uh, Cerrito. Uh, it's a book that is uh, really good for the first uh, several weeks of being a Christian. There's a daily Bible study there. I know that um, uh, he also held a meeting. Matter of fact, these next two guys uh, held a meeting at Cerrito years ago. Uh, but David Farr, minister, writer, past director of the East Tennessee School of Preaching, wrote, In summary, of course, you are right in warning against swimming suits or anything else which provoke lust. There are times when such things need to be specifically named. Uh, Perry Cotham has gone on to his reward. He was a minister, writer, missionary. He wrote, I realize in our days of loose morals, many do not have much modesty. And this is true of many members of the church. The scanty covering of the new lady's bathing suit would, uh, to me, not be very modest. I do not know of any good, faithful gospel preacher who would condone or endorse such a practice. V.P. Black, minister and writer, said, The Bible uh, has much to say about modesty. We are living in an age when the world looks upon modesty as a joke. We, as children of God, should look upon modesty in the light of the word of God and not in the light of the world. There is not anything wrong with giving examples. And last, Winford Clark, elder, minister, author, wrote, As to the matter of modesty, there can be no doubt that mixed swimming males and females would violate the teaching of 1 Timothy 2.9. If a swimsuit would, be, uh, <clears throat> would not be modest by Paul's definition, then it would be hard to find a garment that could be called immodest. I am sure you know that Thayer defines apparel as a lowering, a letting down, a garment let down. It seems that the background would be 
that of ladies who went into the fields to work and would raise their dresses and fold them uh, something like a, into something like a belt or girdle. Thus Paul would speak of the lowering of the garment to cover the nakedness thus exposed. One would surely have a difficult time lowering the modern uh, attire used for swimming. Now, I want to make mention of this as we close out our thoughts. Uh, now, my father-in-law, he had written 20 people, 20 preachers. And, um, and I asked him, I, I asked him some specific questions about these in particular. And I said, you know, is there anybody that, uh, that didn't agree? Is there anybody that said, oh, no, you're just flat out wrong? And, and he said, well, I wrote 20, and one person wrote back and said, I just completely disagree. And that was a man by the name of Rubel Shelley. Now, I don't know if you know Rubel Shelley or not, but uh, many people knew him from years gone by. Uh, he at one time taught soundly in the church for years, but then decided that he was going to teach false doctrine and fall away and has, you know, fall away from the church. He, he preaches still, but he doesn't preach for the Lord's church. It's not, uh, it's not the same thing. Now, I say that to say this, and my father-in-law knew this when he wrote him. He had already uh, had um, uh, fallen away by the time he wrote him. And, um, and of course, remember, this is uh, the man that uh, I believe he said that, uh, speaking of the miniskirt, he said it just keeps getting shorter and shorter, and the end is not yet therefore in sight. And uh, that's what Rubel Shelley said years ago, and then he recanted, and he's saying, oh, no, you're flat wrong. This is, you, this is wrong now. Um, all that being said, I say that to say, you know, when I read off names of people of spiritual giants like Johnny Ramsey, David Farr, and Garland Elkins, and that they're solidly sitting on the truth, and then I hear the opposite being taught by someone like Rubel Shelley, I feel a little better about which camp I'm in. Now, brethren, I, I say that to say, to encourage you to don't be in this man's camp over here. Don't be in line with something that Rubel Shelley teaches. He is just a false teacher. We need to hold fast to the word of God. And we need to follow these things. We need to obey these moral commands. And we need to, we need to do much more than this. Um, but, you know, if our heart is right with God, then this is not going to be a, a hard thing to do. You know, uh, growing up, I was around uh, some uh, good, solid Christians, and I remember uh, a bunch of us going over to a friend's house, and, and uh, there, we, we were, all had to, uh, were all friends, and, and uh, we went to the house of a, uh, a brother and sister, and, uh, and we were hanging out with them, and, and we're all just getting along. And, and at one point, uh, we all went to uh, his little sister's room, and, and we're all kind of about the same age. And, and uh, she had a, a little note card on her dresser. And on her dresser, right there on her mirror, it said, Am I dressed to impress God? You know, am I, am I doing that? Am I in trying to impress other people? Or am I trying to impress God? And really, I hope the answer to that question for all of us is, it doesn't really matter what men think. It really matters how we are in the sight of God. Now, brethren, I know that this is not one of those sermons that you go, oh, you know, this reached out to everybody. You know, this was, man, that makes me uh, uh, feel like I need to, get my life right in all aspects. Maybe it is that it, it spoke specifically to you, and that may be one thing. Uh, but uh, what we need to do is we need, just need to be obedient to the Lord. If we uh, have not yet, if there's someone here who has not yet become a Christian, you can do that tonight. You know, you just need to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And those of us who've done that, then what we need to do is we need to be faithful. And so if you've not been faithful to make things right tonight. Please come as we stand and as we sing.
Good evening. Just have a few things in way of announcements. Uh, coming up Tuesday, uh, the 14th, we'll have the Young at Heart lunch at Tuscany, Italy. I'm not sure when we're leaving to go do that. Ma'am? All right, we're going to say 1030. And if I'm wrong, it's Miss Connie's fault. Uh, let's see. We have a uh, updated youth group calendar. We had a couple things that had to change dates. So if you haven't gotten a youth group calendar within this past week, you might want to go check that on the table outside. Uh, we have two meetings coming up for, for different youth group events. On the 16th, we have a meeting to talk about different things for our trip to the ARC. And on the 26th, we have one for our mission trip to Tennessee. So if you have any questions about that, uh, you can come to the meetings or you can ask me or uh, Mr. David or Mr. Chris about any of that and we can answer those questions for you. Um, we have a Devo tonight. That's probably important for me to, to mention. We have a Devo tonight for uh, any of our youth group, any of our college age kids. We'll have it in the uh, middle auditorium. We'll have, some, we'll have some snacks to have there and it'll just be a good time for everybody to fellowship together. Um, if you haven't had a chance to partake of the Lord's Supper, it'll be in the conference room, out this door and the first door to the left. Had to make sure I had the right direction there. Um, we'll have one more song and then we'll have a closing prayer. Our last song is number 851, Blue Skies and Rainbows. And after this, Jason will have our closing prayer. Blue skies and rainbows and stopping from Girl. 
Let us pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this blessing that we can come and worship you, Lord. We pray that our worship today was in truth and in spirit. We pray that you'll go with us this week. Watch over us, keep us safe, keep us healthy. We pray that you'll help us to love others and serve others. And we pray that you'll be with those who are sick, that you will help to heal them, be with those who are taking care of those who are ill, be with those who are traveling. May they all get safe, get to their safe destination. As many vacations are going on this time of year, we pray that you will watch over those who are traveling, Lord. Lord, go with us now. Please forgive us when we fall short of your word, and it's through Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat> 